Now return to those scholars, like those in the Jesus Seminar, that would say they don't agree with that, then they have to posit the fact, mm. what happened to the body? Again, skeptical scholars have to deny that we do have these multiple sources for the empty tomb in order to deny its historicity. And this leads them to extraordinary historical hypotheses. For example, John Dominic Crossan has to claim that the Gospel of Peter, which is a second century apocryphal gospel, universally rejected in the early church as a forgery, actually contains within it the earliest account of the passion and the resurrection of Jesus. And that all four of the gospels are based upon it and upon the gospel of Mark, which has no other source than this core of the gospel of Peter. Well, scarcely any other historical scholar today agrees with Crossan on this hypothesis. It is, it is extraordinary. Even the other fellows in the Jesus Seminar don't buy into this hypothesis along with Crossan. Uh, and, and yet these are the lengths that you have to go to in order to deny that we have multiple independent attestation of the burial and empty tomb accounts. So in essence, the evidence leaves them hanging at that point. Well, I think the evidence leads them to extraordinarily implausible hypotheses in order to escape the conclusions to which the evidence is pointing. In addition to the credibility of the burial story mm -hmm. and the multiple independent attestation that we have in, in the New Testament for the empty tomb, the empty tomb story is also extremely credible in that it lacks any signs of legendary mm -hmm. embellishment. In order to appreciate this point, all you have to do is to compare the Mark and account of the discovery of the empty tomb with the stories found in the later apocryphal gospels, which arose in the second and third century and beyond. For example, in the Gospel of Peter, uh, the empty tomb is described by having a voice ring out from heaven during the night, two angelic beings descending out of heaven and approaching the tomb. The stone over the door of the tomb rolls back by itself and the two angels go into the tomb. The angels then come out of the tomb uh, supporting Jesus of Nazareth. The heads of the two angels reach up to the clouds, but the head of Jesus reaches beyond the clouds. Then a cross comes out of the tomb following them and a voice from heaven asks, Hast thou preached to them that sleep? And the cross answers, Yea. And all of this is observed by the Roman guards, the Jewish Pharisees and leaders, and a great crowd from the countryside who have come to look at the empty tomb. Now, this is how legends look. They're colored and embellished with all sorts of theological and apologetical motifs, motifs which are strikingly absent from the Markan account. In Mark, there's no fulfilled prophecy, no uh, a description of Jesus emerging from the tomb. No uh, word about uh, Jesus' descent into hell. No uh, reflection on Jesus being the king or the conqueror of death. The women simply come to the tomb, find the stone rolled away, the body missing. They see an angelic vision saying Jesus is not there, and they flee from the tomb. The, the narrative is stark in its simplicity. And this gives reason to think that we're in contact here with very primitive tradition, unembellished by later theological and apologetic developments.